Yeah, I'm going to talk about what is on the screen here, what was the given pipeline. It's a great pleasure to be speaking to you, young people. There are mostly young people here in the audience, and you're the future. It's you we are training for the years to come. And I hope that uh, all universities are training you with a broad experience from different fields. And understand this session is to counteract the fragmentation within biology. There is one biological discipline, period. So that's the title I've been given. But this is what I really would like to talk about. You might think it's a big jump, but it's not. The elephant in the room is, of course, the One Health Initiative, linking to the overall topic of this session, to this session. And the six blind scientists and the elephant in the room is really a parable for environmentally mediated diseases. And I've been using as my example, which I've been studying for quite a number of years. I've been doing quite a lot of work on how climate variation is affecting ecological system, both in terrestrial, freshwater, and marine. And I got somewhat bored by that because I didn't really learn very much new. So I was looking for trying to understand epidemic systems, disease systems, in humans that had a reservoir out in nature. And try to understand how the human diseases are being affected by climate variation that affects the environment, the foci, the reservoir. So the main part of the talk, after some introductory remarks, and these introductory remarks will be covering quite a few slides, I will be talking on plane. And I will work that we have been doing and continue to do on plague, being caused by Yersinia pestis, which caused, among others, the Black Death here. Coming back to that. And as I said, this is not a really big jump from the title I was given and from the topic of the talk or this seminar, being uh, sickness and health, I understand. I say understand because it's in Finnish and I don't read Finnish, but that's what has been translated. But in the introductory remarks, I will emphasize that there is one biology, there is a uni unified biology. And it has been very damaging to various biological disciplines that the fragmentation that we have seen and experienced, and that Biologists that ought to talk together, don't talk together. Biologists that ought to work together, don't work together. So let me start with a unified biology. And this century might become the century of biology. I say might. It has the possibility of be, becoming the century of biology. Why? Because we have a very, very good foundation. Biology as a modern discipline can be traced back to one person and one book, namely this. There's not very many fields that the field is really starting with one book and one person. This one. So we have a very good understanding of the theoretical platform. Much theory is left to be done, but we have a really good platform to ask questions to nature in order to understand nitty-gritty details and the big things in nature. This century might become the century of biology if we take advantage of the classical knowledge represented by Darwin and all the naturalists that follow, and modern 
technology-driven biology here, uh, represented by the double helix. There was a breakthrough that made biology a uh, scientific discipline in 1849. Then it diverged a little bit. Then the discipline was brought back again in 1930. I'm coming back to this. And then the double helix was published in Nature. Fantastic discovery. One page in 1953. And then people forgot, scientists forgot to a large extent, Darwin. One of the big pioneers in biology in the beginning of the 20th century, he said, it was a he, he said, by way of introduction to a talk he gave in 1958, only a few years after the double helix was published. He said, what's on the screen here, may I turn to begin with, with a little known book of nearly 100 years old called The Origin of Species. And those that knew him, and I talked to some of those, they said that this was a proper description of the situation. Darwin was gone from the sea after the double helix. The one that said this is Ronald Fisher being the father, in many respects, of the modern synthesis that brought population biology and genetics together. So, if he managed to bring together the classical disciplines of biology and modern technology-driven biology, we, this century might become the century of biology. I mean, I have a short digression here, and remember the introduction is a digression in itself, and this will be a digression to the introduction, introductory digression. He understood that you need to have units that reproduce and compete with each other for resources. There need to be variation within the population and the need to be heredity. Herited. There need to be something constant that goes from one generation to another. He, Darwin, he understood that. But he didn't understand the mechanism of inheritance, of heredity. He did not understand that. And this was bothering him all along. And as a matter of fact, he, he, he proposed a theory which um, wouldn't have worked. It was really a mess, the whole thing. And he understood that. But he never gave up the idea that there must be something that is passed on from one generation to another. Fairly constant. Two weeks before Darwin died, died, he published a paper in Nature. Very small, it's from the yellow to the yellow. And I'd like to highlight on this one. Some of you in the audience have heard my talk, this talk before, but you haven't heard this part. This paper is about a beetle with a clown that was stuck onto the beetle. And that specimen was given to Charles Darwin by a person from British Midland, whose name was Walter Broadridge Crick. Published a couple of weeks before Darwin died. He was a shoemaker, naturalist of course, a shoemaker which made his living. A few years, many years later, 
many, many years later, the grandson of the creek that gave Charles Darwin the specimen that he writes about here, published the Darwin Hedges. I think this is a nice digression, digression. So this is the starting point. And let me now give you a very, very brief conceptual history of biology, the unified biology, as, we, as I see it. This is elements you all have heard about or know about. I don't need to go into detail. Mendel, he discovered uh, genetics, but he was forgotten. And it was sort of rediscovered. And I think it was rediscovered because when they got the, micro, the microscope, so they could see nucleus, and they could get the idea that this substance that is passing on from one generation to another might actually be in the nucleus. I think it's important to see, to get with the thinking. And this is a dream story from genetics, 1900 or earlier, depending on how you count, double helix, and the whole genomics. Area. Which, of course, is very, very important for us from a medical point of view. We can do things today which we couldn't do only a few years ago or a few decades ago. And that's a technology-driven. This is one example of the technology-driven biology. But it's very little evolution. And nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Topchansky said. But if you are to understand evolution, you have to understand population dynamics. And I have the lemmings here. I have the lemmings because I like lemmings, and it was the first system I started working on. This is my pet organism. Very nice also. Very challenging. Many things we don't understand about lemmings, which are still bothering us. But lemmings was also the starting point for starting modern population biology, modern population, empirically based population biology. Charles Elton, he by chance got interested in the lemming cycles. And immediately he changed direction and started doing population biology. And he started modern, empirically-based population biology. But that's a separate story. But you have to understand ecological interaction if you are to understand the selective pressure. The selective pressure is being determined by the ecological interaction within species and between species. So that's why nothing in evolution makes sense except in the light of ecology. Mike Began at all have said so. When there is natural selection, there is evolution. There might be evolution. There will be evolution if the environment change. If evolution is if, if the environment is constant, evolution might cease. That's a separate story, that's another talk. And the insight we can gain from evolutionary thinking is also important for understanding much of the biology within us. Antibiotic resistance have we reflected more on evolution, we might not have had the problems we have today. But whenever evolution happens, it feeds back to the ecological interaction between individuals within and between population uh, species. And that feedback is very often forgotten.
forgotten and overlooked. This combination of the classical bio biological disciplines, natural history, if you like, population biology, the lower part, and then on the upper part, the technology-driven biology, fantastic things we can do today. And we can ask questions we couldn't even dream of asking and answering only a few years ago. That's why there's a unified biology. That's why there ought to be a unified biology. Starting with this. Let me now come back to the six blind scientists and the elephant in the room. And the six blind scientists is, for me, an uh, illustration or an example, rather, of the fragmentation in biology. This is very often how we do biology today. I don't need to go into detail here. We see only part of the story, part of the problem. That's a fragmentation that is very destructive. This is how biology, this is how science indeed, is being practiced today. We walk in our trenches. We don't look to the other side. We go to different conferences, we read different journals, we read different books, and if we go to the same conference, we go to different sessions. We don't talk to each other, we don't listen to each other. Which we all. This is an example of, disease-related example, really how, if you are to understand Dynamics within a disease system. You have to understand evolution, how it came about. And you have to understand different subdisciplines within biology. If you don't work together, you won't have a full understanding. We need to bridge the gap between the disciplines. We need to bridge gaps between other disciplines. Some focusing on people, some focusing on animal, be it domestic or wildlife. This is really how we should practice sciences. Coming together, chatting to each other, listening to each other, challenging each other outside the narrow subdisciplines. This is the last part of the introductory digression. And I do know what I'm doing time-wise. The elephant in the room is because of one health. That's a defragmentation of the health issue being the topic of this two-day session here. Bringing human medicine and veterinary medicine closer together. Together with those studying wildlife diseases from a veterinary perspective and from an evolutionary ecological perspective. Uh, we have a paper that will come out in the not too distant future where we list a few diseases on the right side here, and which aspects, very sub-disciplines, we really have to bring in in order to understand these diseases. It's a multidisciplinary approach you need to do to address serious issues in wildlife diseases, spilling over to you. That's the introductory remarks. Now the plague. And I will structure my the remaining part of the talk with 
play demands a One Health approach. The study of play required that biologists and social scientists and historians are working together, are joining forces. This is the bacteria. You will see this from time to time, telling me that I'm changing gear. And I will be giving a very, very brief synopsis of plague. I will tell my own story, scientific story, working on plague, starting in Central Asia, Kazakhstan, asking questions about how climate variation is influencing dynamics of play. And there are some concluding remarks. We all have seen pictures like this from the Black Death in the medieval period. It's, it's, there has been three major pandemics. Eusenian, the Black Death, and the third one. There might have been some before the Eustinian, but there's no record of that. The third pandemic in the mid-19th century originated in Yunnan, in China, and then moved slowly down to the coast and took off 1900 to the rest of the world. killed lots of people in Europe, particularly in the southern part of Europe. It really affected human. And plague is caused by Yersenia pestis, the, the bacterium you have seen in a couple of slides already. And it's a problem of Central Asia. We can read in the newspaper from time to time, regularly, every year, that people in Central Asia are being infected by plague, and houses and part of cities are being isolated. But it's not only a problem of Central Asia, it's a problem of the entire world. It was, the bacterium was described by Yersin, the Pasteur Institute. He described this on the basis of what he saw in the third pandemics. But he said, I am pretty sure, well, he didn't say it exactly this way, but he said essentially this, that I'm pretty sure that the Black Death was caused by the same bacteria. And maybe the previous one, Eustine. And there was a, there's been a tremendous discussion among historians and biologists, not listening to each other, but telling each other that the other, part are, the other part, partner is stupid. There had been a tremendous discussion. Was the Black Death caused by Yersenia pestis, or was it something else? And for that matter, was the Eustinian plague caused by Yersenia pestis, or not? Was it something else? Today we know the answer. Thanks to modern technology-driven biology, and I'm very proud to say that people having written these papers, the lead authors, key authors, are now working with us in Oslo. Barbara Bramanti, um, part of her previous team, are working with us. Demonstrating that the Black Death was caused by Yersenia pestis. How did she do that? She took, she, she could isolate Yersenia pestis bacterium from teeth root. And that Yersenia pestis bacterium was found there. I am pretty sure, so are others, that these people died because of that bacteria. As well as using exactly the same method, ancient DNA technology, that the Eustinian plague was caused by Eusenia pestis. 
that's a settled discussion. That's a picture we have of plague. Plague is associated with rats and human fleas. It was really a domestic disease, disease linked to human period. So very often, this is the picture we have. Plague is often mistakenly conveyed as linked primarily to domestic rodents and people and affecting people that way. But this is really the picture you have to understand. This is the dynamics. This is the dynamic network you have to understand. I gave a talk to, uh, to a, a group of medical and health personnel in Vienna a few years ago, very similar to this talk, not, not the first part, but what I'm talking about now, onwards. And after my several hundred people in the audience, medical doctors, many, and after my talk, a couple of people, a couple of uh, professors, medical professors, came up to me and said, oh, Professor Sands had very, very nice talk. I said, fine, I do here. And the other said, I didn't know that plague was a wildlife disease. I thought it was a human disease. This is crazy. Fragmentation in biology. Focusing only on the human part, you miss m most of the dynamics. You really have to understand what's in the, the circle there, or really you have to understand the whole thing. My focus will be this part. Because we must never forget that plague has its main host in non-domestic rodents, and that it only occasionally spills over to the human population. To understand when we get an outbreak in the, in the wildlife is important. And to understand when it spills over to the human population from the wildlife is important to understand. Part of this I will be addressing here. My sort of background when it comes to plague, my plague work, is focusing on gerbils, great gerbils, which is one of several main host species for Yersinia pestis. And it's from several places in large region in Central Asia, where that species is the main host. But you should never forget that Plague is found, or using, in quote mark, a broad spectrum of rodent species, wild rodent species, in different parts of the world. And that different species of fleas are the vector, bringing the bacteria from one host individual to another host individual. And I've been very fortunate to work with Chinese colleagues in China. And that's very fortunate because they have a very good overview and good understanding of the various host systems, rodent species, that are the main reservoir. And it's a broad spectrum of rodent species and fleas, as well as ecological systems. And me being interested in trying to understand how climate variation is affecting the plague system, this is very interesting. Because of course, a given climatic change will have different effects depending on the ecological system and the main host species. And differences like this, we can learn by contrasting. You should be reminded that uh, several people thought that plague was gone, but it keeps popping up again and again. And even Newsweek are paying attention to this, so then it must be important. We believe that the plague was gone, but it's not at all. 
observed recent cases, and is found in natural reservoirs all over the world, typically in drier, higher altitude, predominantly among burrowing, burrow dwelling rodents. And the red is where plague is found today and being quite active today. Where plague has been a dominant disease, has been changing a little bit from the yellow one here being very, very dominant disease in Central Asia. In China, it is the second most important disease, plague and cholera. And it's becoming more and more cases, countries being reported to have plague. But plague is a disease of today. This is some recent statistics worldwide. But as in the previous slide, you saw that in Africa, it's becoming a dominant disease. Most of the cases are found in Africa today. And this is the statistics for Africa. So if you take away the African cases, this is what you're left with. And these epidemics are linked to some countries. Here you have them listed. Some of them only occurring for a year or so. And some are lasting for a longer period. Plague is a disease of the day. My own work on plague started together with fantastic colleagues. I said, my own work is a lie. I've been fortunate to working with talented, very clever, from time to time aggressive, young people. If I hadn't been teaming up with them, I would not be able to tell what I'm telling today. So there will be some reference every once in a while here. And um, the lead authors there are those that have taught us and me much of what I know. You have basically seen this uh, slide before. This, and I, I went to Kazakhstan, rather I discussed at a dinner with a Kazakh scientist. And during the dinner, I became convinced that we should develop a project, EU funded. During the dinner, with lots of wine and good food, I became the PI. Uh, we wrote a proposal, submitted it to the framework program, and we got full funding. As a matter of fact, um, the, one of the reviewers, or two of the reviewers, said that we should get more funding than we asked for. But the bureaucrat said this is impossible. Great gerbil. <clears throat> Plague used to be a big problem in Kazakhstan up until the Second World War. <clears throat> up to a few hundred people died annually, was infected and died annually. The Soviet Union people saw this as a problem. And they started a monitoring program. A monitoring program all across the dry region where you had played. They monitored in the spring, summer, and fall. Wherever they saw a local epidemics starting in the rodent population, they exterminated the rodents and the fleas. <laughs> and lots of other things in the environment, I tell you. This is DDT and ugly stuff. As a matter of fact, I've never seen this myself. Uh, up until a year or so ago, there was a film team from the Norwegian Broadcasting Company that, uh, that uh, approached me. As a matter of fact, that film is coming uh, this Sunday in Norway. Uh, they approached me and said, Nils, could you um, facilitate us doing some filming of this? They've heard about this. They've actually heard me speak about this and seen this picture. Can you organize um, so that we can film this? I said, yes. I said, yes. 
but I knew that I wasn't sure that I could do it, but I said yes. So they, uh, and we had some exchange, and I agreed with the director of the institute I've been working with that uh, this film team should come, and they should be taken out to the field, and they should do this kind of stuff, so that the film team could film it. I wasn't convinced it was going to be done. So I went one day before the film team and talked to the talk science with the director and the scientist there. And uh, we had a good mood. And I said, we will take the film team out there. I was still not sure. But we got out there and they did everything that they used to do during the Soviet Union period exterminating the plague dynamics locally in the wildlife. And it was a huge program. They had 20 field stations in Kazakhstan with an average number of 200 people working. When they were out of the field, they had helicopters taking samples into the labs to see whether there were infection or plague. And we were in one of these labs and immediately when we went in there, I said to the film, don't touch anything in this room. Don't touch. This is really not very safe. <laughs> One of the film team members woke up during the night uh, having a cold, I'm sure. But he thought it was infected by plague. <laughs> and the story is that it was, uh, was infected by plague. They wanted me to confirm, but I said no, not confirm it. But it worked, this monitoring program with the ex local exter extermination of plague. It worked. This is the graph, the, the left one you have seen before, the right one you have seen. After the monitoring program started, very few people got infected. A couple of people, essentially none of which died. So it worked. But of course the Soviet Union, they had also other motivations for involving in this kind of work. Biological weapon. They did actually do an experiment by infecting people in a local village to study how fast an epidemic would spread in a local village. But that's not what I want to talk about. I'm going to talk about our work. This, this monitoring program worked from a health perspective. But it also provided fantastic data because they wrote down everything, everything. Which species was infected? How many was infected? Which species of flea was infected? And it gave data on the number of hosts, number of fleas, and the prevalence bacteria. And we had climate data. Remember I came into this because I was interested in understanding how climate is affecting the plague dynamics. We started this work 2002 about. And our very, very first paper came in science. Not because we are particularly, I think, not because we are particularly smart, I think we are smart too. But it was primarily because of fantastic data, fantastic data. But we were unable to find a climatic component to the play dynamics. So our original objective failed. We failed with respect to the original objective. But we found, well, could identify a threshold. A threshold of the rodent density. The rodent density had to be above a certain level for a couple of years for an epidemic to build up. And the open and closed circles here are two different sides. And along the x-axis, 
well, along the y-axis is whether the burrow is infected or not. Ah, burrow is infected or not. Along the x-axis is the density of rodents for the last two years, or the number of occupied burrows. There has to be a certain density of the host population in order for the epidemics to be realized. This was known from theory, but this is the first demonstration from wildlife of such a threshold. Below, there is no epidemics. Above, there might be an epidemic. But I didn't give up on the climate stuff. I actually thought that this curve up there had a climate component so that it would be a covariate moving it one way or the other depending on the climate, but we weren't able. We weren't, able. We weren't smart enough. <clears throat> I've been working with some stat uh, statisticians on threshold models, statistical threshold models. Below something, something happened. Above, there's something, something else happened, okay? And they, they do theoretical, statistic theory, theory papers. I've published a lot with these people, Havel Tong and Kung Sik Chan, Havel Tong in London, uh, Kung Sik Chan in Iowa, both coming from China. Kung Sik Chan, my good friend, Kung Sik Chan, he, he sent me an email saying, Nils, I have a very, very uh, talented, very, very clever student, Noel. Uh, she's doing some theory on covariates in threshold models. Would you be interested in collaborating with us? Would you be interested in sharing the, the play data with us? I said, of course. Because one covariate could be temperature and, and, and precipitation or climate, if you like. So we did. We handed over to Noel and Kong Sik Chan. You don't have to read this, but this is what I do for a living. You can take it as an illustration. Uh, but this is what you should look at. We learned that plague is affected, affected survival of the gerbils. The more fleas, the lower is the survival. The positive effect of prevalence of rainfall, rainfall has a positive effect, no direct effect of temperature, as we had in an earlier model. But flea plays a key role. The human population, we learned how to combine different kinds of data, human and wildlife data. This is not trivial, I tell you. We learned that the flea dynamics plays a key role, and we confirmed the wildlife threshold model that I, threshold that I just described to you. Extended this to also include features about the flea population. And we discovered the existence of another threshold, which we call a spillover. The flea density on the rodents has to be above a certain density in order for there to be a spillover to other species, including humans or their domestic animals. I think basically the, the fleas are being too crowded, so they jump more, they want to get away. This was a very important insight. Now we understand much better how and when it spills over to the human population. Coming to an end now, asking a larger question, more global question. Really, the question is, what goes on in Central Asia? Does it affect what goes on or went on in Europe? We have very good 
they don't play in Europe during the medieval period. And if you take those data and try to see if there is a link with the climate, climate proxies, there is no link. Suggesting to me that there is no rodent reservoir in Europe. There were no rodent reservoir in Europe. Had there been, there would have been links to the climate, I am sure. But a speculation, of course. But there is link to the climatic situation in Central Asia. And the picture is in Central Asia is that we have a buildup gets above the threshold, builds up, and then if it crashes the rodent population, then it spills over to the human, spills over to the human, and are into the human population. So sort of the, the story we can tell is that good climatic condition, warm and humid, uh, for a couple of years, then generate an epidemic in the uh, wildlife. Uh, then there is a subsequent drought and the population crashes, the rodent population crashes and spills over. Another way of telling this is that something goes on in the, the wildlife system in the Central Asia, moves with humans, maybe as dormant fleas, maybe, we don't know here. But seven years after, no, sorry, sorry, uh, around 10 to 15 years after there is a plague epidemic in the wildlife in Central Asia, we observe that plague occur in harbor cities in Europe and spread through Europe in waves. And they published this. Uh, first of all, it was stopped. It was, this was in PNAS. Uh, it was stopped by uh, uh, Homeland Security um, because it could be used for bioterror. I, I shouldn't know this, but I happen to know because I was in the same room where one of the editors of PNAS exploded when uh, Homeland Security informed them that our paper should be stopped for a bioterror reason. Could be useful. I, and I told immediately, although I shouldn't be part of this discussion, I told them immediately that I know much easier way of doing bioterror because what you, have to, what you can learn from this paper is that to do bioterror, you have to make sure that the rodent population is building up over extensive areas uh, for, and stays li like that for a couple of years, and then over the same extensive area, you have the rodent population crashing. I mean, I can't way. But anyway, uh, there was a huge interest, um, and Mark, the, you were, we were at the same meeting at the ERC, and I wasn't really at the meeting. I was physically at the meeting, but I was somewhere else, because BBC interviewed me for uh, six times that day. Uh, BBC interviewed me, and it spread all over the world. There was several hundred media uh, uh, coverage that, uh, that week. This is only a theory. Now we are testing this by using ancient DNA technology. Because if this theory is right, there should be a great genetic variation across time in the harbor cities than if it wasn't. I mean, you see, I see this. Let me have some concluding reflections. There's a need for interdisciplinarity and collaboration. To contract the fragmentation within sciences. Indeed, the one health this is about health these two days. The One Health perspective is indeed a very right one. And in a fairly recent paper, Influenza in uh, One Health, the John, you had this diagram, which is really quite similar to the diagram I had a little bit earlier in this talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Niels. Um, this was wonderful. Um, are there questions? We have a little time. Can somebody run around with microphones? Do we have anyone? Maybe I can. Is on? Is on? No? 
Questions? To Niels? Mark? I want, I want to have the wine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Niels, for the wonderful talk. So you mentioned that in Kazakhstan, some village people were infected intentionally. Was that what you discovered, or this is public knowledge <laughs> over there? Because this is very serious. I have never heard something like that. This reminds me of Dr. Mengele, actually. Well, it was something that, uh, that we talked about, uh, that was talk talked about, and whenever there was much uh, vodka on the table, uh, they started telling about this. Um, but then uh, the next day after the vodka was gone from the, from the body, they said, don't talk about this. Don't talk about this. Um, and then uh, a couple of us, this was after the Soviet Union period, no, this was during the Soviet Union period, but a, a, a short while after the Soviet Union, we got an invitation to a meeting to discuss this incident or experiment. And a couple of us, we responded back and said, is this now official? Then we got the response, the meeting is canceled. So we got an invitation by mistake. <laughs> it should be an internal meeting. Anyone else? Question time. Well, Nils, it appears that you were. Um, I, I, I will end with. A, I will end. I will end with a, uh, this vodka. May, made me remember something else. Uh, I, if you allow me for a second, uh, please. Yeah, um, we have an EU project, well funded, and there was part of this project. There was an agreement signed by Kazakh authorities that we should get. I think it was seven strains out of Kazakhstan. Uh, the, the previous person that had gotten it legally out was Kennedy, I think. He had gotten plague strains out of Kazakhstan. No one else had gotten it legally. Uh, we should get this out and do work on them in pa Paris, Pasteur incident. But when it comes to actually them sending us the samples, they said, there is no such agreement. I said, you have signed. No. So then we had a meeting, and I used the opportunity as PI, and said to the director, now we should sit down and discuss, and we should have a negotiation. Ah, oh, fine. So we sat down. I had a colleague with me, and he had several colleagues with him on the other side. In a minute we started, a vodka bottle came on the table. And water, thanks God, water also came on the, on the table, and two glasses for each of us. And I said to my friend, who could speak Danish, so I said in Norwegian, uh, you have to do the drinking during this discussion. And the Kazakh people were so impressed by me because I was drinking so much, I was drinking all the time. But it was only the water. I was nerve. I was extremely nervous. I was mixing the glass, and of course, you, you can't tell the difference between. So I was negotiating very successfully with alcohol, without alcohol. We didn't get out uh, the plague, but we got the sir. But it, we didn't get out the plague because of uh, 9/11. Thank you again.